Great. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about the climate crisis and mental health. And as I'll describe, the robust research in theory on climate change and mental health is relatively new and rapidly evolving, and therapy specific to climate is truly in its infancy. Um, however, this area is a really big and complex topic. So, you know, today is kind of, you know, a teaser of, of some of the sort of big, big points, and there's, there's lots more here, but this is a good, um, I think, intro to all of the concepts. So let's get started and we'll kind of get into those details. So I have no disclosures to report. Um, first, I wanna say upfront that hearing about the sobering effects of climate change on mental health can sometimes stir up emotions for people. It's a topic that most, if not all of us can relate to personally on some level. And you all are, of course, very knowledgeable about the climate crisis, so you won't be surprised at all the variety of ways that it affects mental health. But please know, as I'm talking about it, um, that it's not only normal if some of this hits home emotionally for you, it's, it's also an indication that you care about what's happening. And I really like these words from Thomas Doherty, who's an eminent clinical psychologist in the climate arena. We hurt where we care. Before we get into the mental health details, I wanna quickly give you some background um, to help situate you with where the field is right now and give you an idea about how climate psychology, um, how new it is. And um, there's, we'll talk about different organizations. I know Lisa, you mentioned Climate Psychiatry Alliance and I'm actually a psychologist, so I'm in the Climate Psychology Alliance, but they're very connected and, um, and very integrated. So just, just to clarify that though. Um, some mental health professionals have been dealing with climate change in various capacities for many years, but it's really been in the past decade that things have rapidly escalated in terms of research and knowledge. And it's been only in the past year, year and a half, two years, that the field has really taken off in terms of urgency and in terms of clinical, academic, media, and public attention. So climate psychology itself is a subset of eco-psychology that focuses specifically on climate change and the ways it affects mental health. So just to let you know a little bit about eco-psychology, um, the, the 1960s through 2000s, that was the era of first generation eco-psychology. The connection between humans and nature, you know, has been important obviously throughout human history, but we have not included nature in Western models of mental health for very long at all. So first generation eco-psychology existed as a counterculture movement to mainstream academic psychology and psychiatry, uh, both of which ignored then and often still do um, the relationship between humans and nature and saw mental health as like interpsychic conflict, biology, or eventually embedded in some smaller systems like couples or families. But eco-psychology saw and continues to see people and nature as embedded in a system together. So this is a description that I think describes it really well. Eco-psychology is the way of looking at the human being and the world no longer as if they were two separate and independent things, but recognizing how much we are a part of life in this beautiful green and blue planet. Um, in 2009, the American Psychological Association um, was really kind of ahead of the curve and convened its first task force on climate change and then published that report um, from that task force in 2011. 2009 also brought the first peer-reviewed ecotherapy journal, which was designed to usher in a second generation of eco-psychology that held on to some of the ideals of the first generation while also bringing the field into the academic mainstream. So you can see from these dates just how new some of this is. In even more recent years, with the increasing urgency of the climate crisis, nonprofit organizations developed to start trying to raise awareness and to develop additional knowledge around mental health and climate change. So these are the main groups in the UK and the US, and there are also some others around the world as well. 
Um, Division 34 of APA, which is the bottom right there, the Society for Environmental Population and Conservation Psychology, is home to a number of um, prominent climate researchers. You have probably seen these types of news articles um, over the last year or two. They've been all over the place um, because climate and mental health has really exploded in the media over that time frame. So these headlines are obviously just a small sample, but in terms of working with individuals, there's not yet an empirically supported therapy for climate change distress. Um, we're probably a, a long way away from having something like that. And you can see from some of these sub headlines um, that most therapists don't know what to do or how to help people with climate concerns. So um, this is obviously a really important issue and the organizations on the previous slide, as well as a very, very, very small number of new training programs that are getting started are in part designed to teach clinicians in this area. So the last slide um, obviously referenced individual therapy, but mental health effects from climate change occur on the societal level as well, of course. So let's kind of get into some of those effects. So to start with, of course, the most essential and obvious thing about the climate crisis is that it's a crisis about existence. Our very lives, our civilization, our ecosystems, our world are imperiled. And on that basis alone, it's a mental health issue. And it's completely understandable that people are afraid. As you know, the playing field is not level for everyone whose existence is at risk. And so the intersectional aspects of climate change are really critical to keep front and center as we're thinking about all of these things. Climate change is a multiplier that amplifies inequality and lack of access to resources, among other things. So people who are already marginalized and disadvantaged disproportionately bear and will continue to bear the brunt of the effects of climate change, including the mental health effects. So you can see the different groups here um, who are most at risk. I'll be talking um, a little bit more about some of these groups in just a minute. In general, um, as described here by the IPCC, climate change threatens mental health due to exposure to heat, extreme weather events, displacement and migration, food insecurity and malnutrition, conflict, economic and social losses, and anxiety and distress associated with worry about the climate. We'll get into the specific mental health impacts shortly, but first there are, are several dimensions that can affect a person's mental health response in situations caused by climate change. Um, the impacts of climate change can be direct, such as extreme weather events and a changed environment, or indirect, such as being uncertain about future risks or feeling threatened by observing impacts, even in the news. Uh, impacts can also be discrete or chronic, so limited one-time events versus sort of chronic, ongoing community effects um, around one in their, in their community. Another dimension relates to climate-related disasters, where we know that the greater and more intense the exposure, no matter how it's measured, the higher the risk of subsequent psychopathology. Numerous mental health issues result from increasing temperatures of climate change. We have good data already on all of these coming up in the next slide, um, next slides, but we are continue to accumulate data all the time. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go into detail on only some of these, but as temperature increases, so do psychiatric hospitalizations, sleep disorders, substance abuse, um, that's seen as likely a maladaptive attempt to cope. Cognitive issues like decreased performance on some tasks. Interpersonal violence of all kinds, including intergroup conflict, domestic violence, and child abuse. And suicide. So this was some important research from 2018 looking at comprehensive data across multiple decades in both the US and Mexico. And what the research found was that suicide rates rise 
in US counties and 2.1% in Mexican municipalities for a one degree centigrade increase in monthly average temperature. So this effect is similar whether the region is hotter or cooler and it has not decreased over time. And again, they looked at multiple decades. Um, if you're not familiar with the term RCP 8.5, which uh, stands for representative concentration pathways, it's a high emission scenario that is often referred to as business as usual. In other words, if we just keep doing what we're doing uh, in terms of climate emissions. These researchers predict that with business as usual, we'll have 9,000 to 40,000 additional suicides across the US and Mexico alone by 2050. I want to um, get into aggression and violence to get against children in just a minute, but first I wanna talk um, about children in general. In 2021, UNICEF reported that nearly 1 billion children live in one of the 35 countries most at risk from the climate crisis. Among groups at heightened risk from climate change, children are really uniquely at risk from a mental health perspective. Um, of course, they are also from um, other medical and health perspectives, um, but from a mental health perspective for a number of reasons. Developmentally, for example, events have a much larger impact during the formative years when children's sense of security in the world and with other human beings, as well as their sense of self is being shaped for a lifetime. Children exposed to disasters are vulnerable to symptoms of anxiety like PTSD, panic, phobias, um, also to depression and acute stress reactions and adjustment disorder. And it's true for everyone uh, that they're vulnerable, that people are vulnerable to these kinds of things, but children in particular are less likely to be able to cope with what they've gone through. And because they are reliant on others, that's amplified if they have stressed or unsupportive caregivers, or if they're separated from their caregivers during the crisis. Child abuse is also a consequence of climate change. According to the CDC and other emerging data, children are at increased risk of child abuse due to the increases in aggression and violence from rising temperatures. We don't know the full scope of this yet in terms of the research um, that's growing, but extrapolating from the literature also suggests that the stress from things like fewer resources due to climate migration, food insecurity from drought, and disruption due to climate causes can also make people more prone to engage in child abuse. And studies have shown that families that are more vulnerable to loss of food and shelter after natural disasters commit violence against children more frequently. All kinds of child abuse, whether it's physical, sexual, and psychological, are traumatic and absolutely devastating to a child's emotional development and mental health. And child abuse is one of the adverse childhood experiences or ACEs that is a marker of lifetime mental health problems. Here are some pathways um, that have been mapped by some researchers to show how natural disasters caused by climate can result in child abuse. They include environmentally induced changes in supervision, accompaniment and child separation, transgression of social norms in post-disaster behavior, economic stress, negative coping with stress and insecure shelter and living conditions. This information is important, not just to understand how child abuse, um, the different pathways to that, but also in terms of being able to design in the future targeted prevention services to try to intervene in some of these pathways. And that's a focus of additional research in the future. Children are at risk emotionally in other ways too. This was a remarkable study published in December of 21 in the Lancet's Planetary Health Journal of 10,000 16 to 25 year olds who were asked about their feelings and beliefs about climate change. As you can see, there was a, a very broad sampling um, around the world, 10 countries, and those countries represented a range of cultures, incomes, climates, climate vulnerabilities, and exposure to differing intensities of climate-related events. There were 1,000 young people per country, and the ages were pretty, pretty well divided, um, an equal, basically an equal percentage uh, who were 16 to 25, 
verses 21 to 25. I'm sorry, 16 to 20, and then 21 to 25. And it was uh, the sample was pretty evenly split, uh, split in terms of gender as well. From the same study, um, we can see that these very sobering responses. 56% of these young people um, believe that humanity is doomed. 65% believe that government is failing young people across the world. 75% feel that the future is frightening. And 83% feel like people have failed to take care of the planet. Additionally, 45% say that their feelings about climate change negatively affect their daily life. These are some graphics uh, that I just took out of a different journal discussing the same study. And you can see that 95% of these same young people are worried about climate change and that they feel a lot of negative emotions about climate change as well with 68% feeling sad and also 68% feeling afraid. If you look down the chart there, you can see that not many felt optimistic um, or even indifferent. Against this backdrop, um, children and young adults are of course faced with an entire lifetime of climate change ahead of them. Uh, Lisa Van Susteren is a highly regarded psychiatrist who's written a lot about climate change and who's involved with Climate Psychiatry Alliance and the Climate Psychology Alliance. As she notes, our children cannot be relieved of their fears with words. Real menace is thrusting them into existential uncertainty. We must acknowledge that the psychological well being of our children is on the line. The anxiety people feel related to climate has been termed climate anxiety or eco anxiety. Those terms are used pretty interchangeably, although climate anxiety seems to be the term that is sort of taking off in the past few years. Climate anxiety is, is really multifaceted, and there are lots and lots of definitions of it in use. Um, but Pakala did some, some great research looking at, you know, what does it actually mean? And so here are some of the characteristics that he discusses. Um, climate or eco-anxiety is existential, as we've talked about. Um, it's often non-pathological, which I'll talk more about shortly, and it relates to uncertainty. It's also connected to other emotions like fear, anger, grief, despair, guilt, and shame. This is some new, some new research that's in part about the concept of worry versus um, the concept of anxiety. It's in the upcoming October issue of the Journal of Environmental Psychology. It's the first detailed study of climate anxiety in the UK. It used, um, as opposed to the, the large study of youth, which used a binary scale, just yes, no questions. This one used the climate change anxiety scale, which was developed by prominent eco-psychologist Susan Clayton, and that it uses a five-point Likert scale just to measure cognitive, emotional, and behavioral effects of climate anxiety, as opposed to worry and feelings. Um, you can see this sample is a much older sample with a median age of 48, and it's a much wider sample um, with an 82% people um, who are white. So they're you know, different results kind of as a result of that. And um, as young people are the, the group that is most concerned, uh, which this study also found in terms of them having higher generalized anxiety um, and more likely to experience eco-anxiety. So um, you can see here that there were 46% of participants who were very or extremely worried about climate change, um, which is still a high number. They're, CCAS scores of climate anxiety as opposed to worry were much lower, only a 1.25 on a one to five scale. It's not clear yet what that means. There are a lot of potential reasons for that, but um, I just wanted to show you that just to show you that this is again, sort of the first detailed study in this area. And this, this particular measure is starting to be used and um, it will have implications for how we think about worry versus anxiety and how we try to measure that. Um, importantly, this was the first study to capture a negative association between mindfulness as a trait 
and climate anxiety, which is really helpful as we think about the things that are really helpful aspects of treatment. Um, now looking at the US using data from the Yale program for climate change communication, 65% of American adults are worried about global warming. Politically speaking, it's 27% of conservative Republicans who are worried, 57% of moderate Republicans, 66% of independents, 86% of moderate Democrats, and 94% of liberal Democrats. When we look at racial differences, in a recent American Psychiatric Association poll of just over 2,000 adults, Black Americans were the most likely to report anxiety over the impact of climate change on the planet. Um, they were at 65% and Hispanic adults were next at 62% versus all adults at 55% and white adults at 52%. I think this really speaks to the racial inequity and social justice aspects of climate change. Um, environmental racism means that black Americans, for example, um, are more likely to live in areas prone to flooding near refineries and other polluters, as I'm sure you know. Um, a 2000, or 2020 study of over 100 U.S. cities, including Detroit, found that many historically redlined minority districts comprise the hottest areas of the country. Um, so, you know, we know that, again, uh, Black Americans are in the group among people who are going to be most effective and who are already being most affected by climate change. We can see how this could easily connect to um, having anxiety about it. Um, incidentally, for anyone who's interested, there was some really good reporting uh, earlier this week on Wednesday on NPR um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Fiona about the ways in which the Latino community worldwide is also in the crosshairs of climate change. So I encourage you to check that out um, on the NPR website if you're, if you're interested. Stress, anxiety, and fear are pervasive when it comes to climate change. Um, lots of scenarios, parents worried about their children's future, all people worried about their survival, either now or in the future, the stress of losing a home or of losing belongings to floods, to fires, losing flood insurance, being displaced, compromised physical health from climate that then leads to stress. And even though we, we were already talking about climate anxiety, there's also other anxiety that can come up in climate situations um, in a recent APA presentation, the psychologist Nancy Piotrowski pointed out, um, I thought, a really useful um, scenario about uh, if a child or elder, for example, has asthma um, and is having difficulty with breathing due to particulate pollution, that you know, when that breathing is threatened, that caregivers also might experience psychological consequences like fear and stress. So it really goes in all directions, and we have to look at the people around the people being affected as well. So it's a very multidimensional issue. Trauma like PTSD and acute stress disorder is common after natural disasters. And there are numerous losses due to climate change as well. And this leads to grief in many people, losses and anticipated losses, I should say. To use a local example, uh, winter traditions in Michigan are already changing a bit as winters change and as the ice is stable for shorter periods of time. Many indigenous communities around the world are facing the loss of important aspects of their cultures. It's the loss of animal species in nature, which is very painful for a lot of people. Farmers are already on the front lines of climate change as the growing seasons change and severe storms affect crops, for example, and they have to deal with the stress of how to manage that and thinking about how their work will be evolving over time. And as temperatures continue to increase, outdoor professions will also continue to be more adversely affected. They already are, but it will worsen. There's also a loss of autonomy and control for all people due to circumstances changing and feeling unable to stop them. And that can lead to both anxiety and depression. This quote is an example of the loss of traditions and culture. It's from an Ojibwe man who, with his family, is the last remaining maple sugar producer on the Quinoa Bay Reservation, even though maple sugaring was a longtime part of the culture. 
and I'll just read it. Um, we as Ojibwe people don't have the luxury of migrating with those trees that have been taking care of our people for thousands of years. When you have a relationship with the land, the trees, the water, and fish, you notice when something's not right, just like with your children or your family members. Climate change has just been making so many uncertainties prominent. Our trees who respond to those temperature differences are changing. For indigenous communities, there can be really a deeply painful experience of climate grief because of their connection to nature and the land itself. I don't think there's any better description than this one from an indigenous storyteller in Australia to demonstrate that grief. She says, we see and feel the spirit of our animals and our land. They are our ancestor spirits. We don't own country, country owns us. We come from her to protect her. When country hurts, we hurt. When our animals, our spirit cousins cry, we cry. Another loss that comes up with climate is loss of place. Migration due to climate change is already happening and is predicted to increase dramatically in the years ahead. Not only does this strain resources and disrupt people's lives and communities, it rips them from the land that is their home. We know that strong attachment to places results in stability and a sense of security and forms part of one's personal identity. Additionally, people with stronger attachment to their communities report greater happiness, greater life satisfaction, and greater optimism. So we can see the tremendous mental health risks of having local communities be torn apart or lost. Just some terminology here. One aspect of loss of place is solastalgia, which is a concept first described, first described by the Australian environmental researcher and philosopher Glenn Albrecht in the mid 2000s. Um, as he defines it here, as opposed to nostalgia, the melancholia or homesickness experienced by individuals when separated from a loved home, solastalgia is the distress that is produced by environmental change impacting on people while they are directly connected to their home environment. It's, it's often described sort of as homesickness for a home or ecosystem that doesn't exist anymore. It's sort of the feeling that you're losing a place that's important to you. This takes us towards some things we need to keep in mind when climate concerns become mental health issues. So avoiding over pathologizing, this is really, really important, um, particularly since some mental health models have historically situated the problem within the individual, and some still do. Um, so it's really, you know, context is really critical here when thinking about what people are experiencing. Remember, most people have a lot of, of feelings and often a lot of really strong feelings about climate change. So it's not abnormal to feel those. Functionally, um, you know, that's kind of where we can look and to, to use functionality as a good marker to indicate when something has become really problematic for somebody and where they can benefit from more help. Because sometimes these things just become so overwhelming that it gets hard to function. Adaptation versus mitigation. Um, adaptation and mitigation are concepts in climate change generally. Um, as you might be familiar with, you know, uh, population-wise and individually, we need to both adapt to the effect of climate change, and of course, we need to mitigate the effects of climate change. Mental health professionals need to help with both of these things. Um, ad adaptation is, is going to be necessary, um, and it will be critically important in the future as well, and um, mental health professionals are really poised in, to be at the forefront of that and to help people adjust and become resilient. In terms of mitigation, taking action can be incredibly empowering for people, and it thus has the potential to improve mental health because it counteracts hopelessness and helplessness. We also know from the research that taking smaller pro-environmental steps leads to taking bigger pro-environmental steps. This is very new research. Um, and it's, that's, it's really important um, because if we can help even people who are feeling overwhelmed, if we can help 
um, mental health wise to, to give them some motivation, help them take smaller steps that can lead them to then take the larger steps that we need as well. And even taking smaller steps helps people in terms of mental health. Um, in terms of individual versus societal issue, um, treating individuals does not mean that we don't treat structural issues that cause and perpetuate climate change, such as societal reliance on fossil fuels and economic systems that focus on growth in a consumer economy. And it's really important in the healthcare um, or in the mental health care profession that, that we keep this in mind at all times and that we actually work on the societal level as well. So people often feel really overwhelmed um, and guilty about their role in climate change or about their inability to change the entire, entire system alone. So it's really important to truly recognize the reality that our society is built around fossil fuel consumption and individuals are not to blame for the falsehoods that we've been told from the fossil fuel industry for a long time. As I'm sure you know, there are decades old records from the big oil companies that demonstrate that they knew then that they were going to harm humans and the planet. Furthermore, they deliberately created the narrative that individuals, rather than the fossil fuel companies themselves, are responsible for saving the planet. So they put the blame and responsibility on all of us. And um, accepting that blame is, is really disempowering. And it's really important um, in mental health to counteract that narrative and to let people know um, how they have been part of this system um, and to work on their guilt uh, in this way. And we do also have to address the structural issues like systemic inequalities that increase the harms of climate change. There are also the issues of capitalistic growth and consumption, which underlie numerous environmental issues, of course, including fossil fuel use. And indeed, the latest IPCC report states that there is greater need for transformational changes to health and other systems. This highlights an urgent and immediate need to address the wider interactions between environmental change, socioeconomic development, and human health and well being. Hickman et al., in that study that we looked at with 10,000 young people, um, they note that current narratives really risk individualizing the so-called problem of climate anxiety with suggestions that the best response is for the individual to take action. But that our results suggest that such action needs to particularly be taken by those in power. So again, while we know that taking action as an individual is really important, it's empowering, and it helps to counteract hopelessness and helplessness that also needs to be done in the context of working on things at a larger level. And it's critical um, that those in power do that as well. And again, this is a place where the mental health profession working in this larger way uh, can also make a difference. So coming up here on the, on the end of, of what I'm gonna talk about today before we do questions, but um, let's, let's talk about hope. This is a word not often associated with climate change um, for obvious reasons. And, and people often get really worried when they hear the word hope or the concept of hope because they think it means we, we think things aren't as serious and dire as they are. But when I talk about hope, I'm not talking about toxic positivity or naive hope, but about legitimate hope. So when hope is based in reality, it can be very motivating and it can counteract emotions that are demotivating. Feeling doomed and helpless, um, which again, very understandable feelings, but those can become a cycle where we feel too overwhelmed to take action. And we need to take action, really big action over the long haul. So we do need to have ways to make it through emotionally and keep ourselves going. And hope can help us do that. Ellen Kelsey, who is a leading environmental scholar and educator, calls this evidence-based hope. In contrast to toxic positivity, she thinks people should be concerned with toxic negativity because we are so influenced psychologically by the negativity around us. It's a really critical idea and really important. It's one that's often lost, um, I think. 
She points out that only two to 3% of news on climate talks about solutions, not because there aren't solutions out there, but because it's not reported on. So we are really getting a negative bias. Um, again, important for us to have the information, um, but it's also important to keep this other piece in mind too. So there are a lot of things that we don't know about that are hopeful and that can help keep us motivated. Solution-focused journalism is a counter to negative news, and that's something that um, Ellen Kelsey is involved with as well. And again, it's being fully realistic and not Pollyanna-ish when we think about this. It's not that the news isn't bad, but that there is also some good to find. And importantly, let's not forget that we can also create our own. So I am gonna stop right there. Um, and I wanna share with you here my contact information. Please reach out to me at any time. I would be happy to talk with you about any aspects of any of this. And um, if there are any questions, I know we have a little bit of time left. Um, so I'll try to answer what I can. And um, I'd also be interested, I'd kind of like to open it up as well. If, if any of you would like to share any of your own experiences with climate and mental health, whatever that looks like, whether that's personal, or I'm also really curious if you are seeing it in your clinical work at all, um, or however that's coming up. One of the things I, I didn't get too much into sort of aspects of, of treatment, but one of the things we know is that people, um, a large percentage of people don't talk about um, climate, even though they're so worried. Most people don't talk about it. They don't talk about it with their doctors. They don't talk about it with their therapists. And, um, and yet we can see what a profound effect it is having on people. So one of the things to think about is how do we open that up for people? You know, do we add it to an intake? Do we ask the question? Do we listen for it? And um, so I'm curious to, to hear if that's ever come up for any of you. Um, so we can, I'm gonna stop sharing and we can kind of